It's no secret that writing can be lonely work, but does it really have to be? Whether you're full-time, part-time, or just starting out, you'll get insights into the tricks, tips, and production habits of writers from every level of the biz. From best-selling authors to those launching their first novels, you're sure to be in the company of friends as we encourage great writers to divulge and share their secrets. This is The Great Writer Share Podcast with your host, best-selling author, Daniel Wilcox. Hello and welcome to the Great Writer Share podcast with me, Daniel Wilcox, where every week I hijack an hour or so of time from some of the kindest and hardest working writers around today to join me on the show and discuss everything that makes them tick, raw and bounce. Today's day is the 14th of April. We are now hitting week three of quarantine in the UK. It's been an interesting few weeks. Um, I've had, <laughs> I've had, as you probably would have gathered from last week's episode, I've had my son for... Um, probably a week solid just handling him by myself and I, I gotta tell you my my heart goes out to single parents out there people who uh, are trying to juggle work with kids um it's it's tough like they're, they're fantastic little beings and I love my son unconditionally it has had its challenges um but you know you do what you gotta do in these crazy times we could be in a lot worse situations so keep pushing on and uh, hopefully you as writers are all getting your words in and making the most of it um i've been just trying to get the barest minimum done of what i can i officially yesterday launched the promo of my horror experiment that i mentioned uh, probably about two months ago now um which i'm kind of happy to reveal that what i'm essentially doing is running a live write in which i take a large novel that will essentially act as one season of a tv show and then each episode i'm going to release um or each chapter I'm releasing on my Patreon as I write. And then once the episode is finished, I'm going to bundle that together, put that into an episode on uh, KDP, throw that up, and then just keep releasing them and releasing them. And uh, for long-time listeners of the show, it's very much the John Cronshaw model of how he's been writing epic fantasy. And uh, it's something that I want to trial for horror and see how it works. And at the minute, the reception's going pretty well. I've got quite a lot of... Uh, uh, good reviews and comments on the cover art and some of the promo and people saying they're excited to see serialization come back to horror because as far as i'm aware i've not really seen a whole lot of large scale serial horror at the minute so it'll be interesting to see how that goes um, but i have gathered a few patrons who have jumped on board to join in on the journey if you are a writer or a reader of horror feel free to join me um, i'll put links in the show notes but uh, you can just do that at patreon.com forward slash daniel wilcox and yeah, the interesting part will be once I've compiled them all and put them onto Amazon to see how they sell and whether or not they, that gains any traction. Because one of the difficult things about horror, as opposed to something like epic fantasy, is that horror, you tend to kill a lot of people off, which means there aren't a great deal of characters at the end to continue on to season two. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens, but that's where I'm at at the minute. Uh, I'm also where am I I uh, it's quarantine <laughs> I'm gonna keep this in because why the hell not um I am also still uh chipping away at the collaboration for author's book my first non-fiction um it's hit at about I think 35,000 words at the minute uh I've got a couple of very very high profile authors that are going to be jumping in and giving their opinions and quotes and useful tidbits from them throughout the book as well so I'm just waiting for them to come back with bits and pieces that I'm going to sew into the book and then that should be ready to probably go, I'd say, end of May, June, possibly. Um, I'll put on a more firm date probably within the next week or so. But yeah, want to want to get that out to you guys so we can start just sharing some more knowledge. Um, and one final announcement in terms of personal stuff, something I've not put yet on this show, which is coming up very, very soon, is I'm excited to say that myself and Sasha Black are uh, teaming up to produce yet another podcast um this podcast is going to be called the next level authors podcast and focuses all on us two as authors as we try and work together and hold ourselves accountable to reach the next level of our author journey uh sasha came on the show i'm not 100 sure i probably should have looked up what episode she was she came on the show um quite early on i believe and uh yeah we clicked we've got a lot of stuff in common we're very similar points within our writing career we've got a lot of similar goals um and so it just seemed right that we should share some of what we're doing and you know they're only going to be short episodes um once a week that we can share and if you want something or someone or some people to <laughs> hold you accountable then join us along for that journey um should have some news for that soon i believe 
we're aiming to go live this month if we can. We're just waiting on a couple of uh, final T's to cross and a couple of I's to dot. So exciting times. Sasha, if you're listening, this should be fun. Today's guest is Tosca Lee, who is a thriller and historic writer who is famed for her research. Um, she's been in the game for a long time. She's won a fair amount of awards, which we'll go into in her in, in her introduction. Um, but it was it was a genuine pleasure talking to Tosca. She was very very interesting. She's got a lot of uh, wisdom to share. She uh, just shares and shares unreservedly. Um, and in this interview, we go into lots of different things. Some of the key ones being we talk about the naivety that comes with writing your first novel and how you can overcome that first hurdle. Um, Tosca goes very very deep into how her writing journey got started and it's very interesting I won't I won't spoil it for you for now we also go a lot into her research process and we talk about the software she used how her uh, process has changed over time how you approach different experts in order to make sure that what you're saying is true and accurate um, so we go very very deep into that and also how to make the perfect soup which for me was interesting because I'm very into making soups right now we do also have a new patron this week. So thank you very much, Katie Forrest, uh, another, another previous guest who's been on the show. Um, thank you for joining us over at Patreon. So it is brought to you by all of my patrons over at patreon.com forward slash great writers share who help keep the lights on and keep the wheels turning. Um, so if you want to find out about loads of extra bonuses, just go over to www.patreon.com forward slash great writers share. And one more time, thank you, Katie, for coming on board and uh, looking forward to bringing some extra value to you. As there was no question last week, I am going to throw a question out there this week for people. Based off of this interview, the question is, how do you approach the research and planning for your books? So whether you're fiction or nonfiction, uh, it might change, it might not. How do you approach the research and planning for your books? You can answer that by emailing in. You can go over to the Facebook group on the Patreon group, or you can just tag me at Wilcox Author or use the hashtag Great Writers Share. Now, without any further ado, let's dive into the interview with the one and only Tosca Lee. Enjoy. Tosca Lee is the multi-award winning New York Times, Indie Bound and Amazon bestselling author of 11 novels, including The Line Between, The Progeny, Firstborn, The Legend of Sheba, Iscariot and The Books of Mortals trilogy with New York Times bestseller Ted Decker. Her work has been translated into 17 languages and options for TV and film. She is best known for her meticulous research, masterful prose, unexpected points of view, and high-octane thrillers. A notorious night owl, she loves movies, playing video games with her kids, and sending cheesy texts to her husband. She's also a big fan of her amazing readers. Tosca, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. I'm excited to have you. Uh, my first question I'm going to jump into is nothing to do with writing, but it just comes straight out of that intro, which is, mm -hmm. you say you enjoy playing video games with your children. <laughs> what are your favorite video games to play at the minute? <clears throat> Call of Duty, <laughs> Ooh, nice. which uh, I am not good at, just for the record. <laughs> so I am not good. I, I think they only want me to play so that they can kill me or prove how great they are. So there you Everyone go. needs a bit of bait <laughs> to go out there and just lure away people. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I read, so jumping into uh, your, your writing and everything around, I was reading a mm -hmm. quote that um, was in The Nerd Daily in August 2019 from yourself. Mm -hmm. It says, I'm an author, ballerina, bacon lover, TV addict, obsessive master <laughs> procrastinator, married to a hot farmer uh -huh. with four kids, whose 11th uh -huh. novel releases in September, uh, September. Also, mm -hmm. I make good soup. What yes, makes a good soup to you? <laughs> uh, a good soup to me has a good flavor and good texture. And so uh, most recently I've been perfecting asparagus soup. And so Ooh, I nice. love that. I love cream soups. I mean, who, how can you not love a creamy soup? Um, mushroom soup. And then of course, now that we're, you know, in the time of COVID-19 and we're all stuck at home, <laughs> um, I discovered a trove of um, uh, cans of tomatoes and so chili everywhere and Ooh. lots of chili <laughs> mm. so yeah does your novel uh, novel does your freezer look like my freezer in which is she is packed full of uh, tupperware boxes uh, of bolognese of chili of anything that will freeze yes food. yes lots of frozen soup and lots of surprises you know I, I went in there and organized it recently and every now and then there's there's you know this oh I didn't know we had this or <laughs> where did this come from or how long has that been there 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit about how you got into writing and uh, just an overview of where your writing journey came from, just for any of my listeners that might not be aware of who you are. Sure. Um, you know, I, I never really grew up uh, thinking about writing as a, a thing. I mean, it's something I did. And I used to win contests as a kid, but I, I was really determined to become a classical ballerina. And I trained um, really hard to that end for many years of my early life. And, uh, but when I was a teenager, I, I ripped a muscle and it kind of became apparent to me that that may not be the way that my life was going to go. And so uh, I went off to college and I was home visiting during my first year of college. Um, I live in Nebraska and I went to school in Massachusetts on the coast. And I was talking about one of my favorite books of all time, which is The Mists of Babylon, which is a retelling of the King Arthur story, actually. Um, so I've been to all the places over there <laughs> that are associated with the King Arthur story. Um, but I was talking about how a great book is like a roller coaster. Um, it's got its ups and downs and twists and turns. And that day while I was talking with my dad, I just blurted out, you know, I think I'd like to, I think I'd like to, to write a book. And I, the idea was I wanted to see if I could create an emotional roller coaster ride for somebody else, the way somebody else had created that for me. And so my dad said, okay, I will make you a deal. I was supposed to spend that summer working at a bank. Um, and uh, my dad said, I will uh, pay you what you would have made working at the bank if you will uh, spend your summer writing your first novel and do it full time like a job. Wow. And so I did. I wrote my first novel. It was about the um, Stonehenge people of um, Salisbury Plain there, right over where you <laughs> are. <laughs> yeah. Um, so and it was a terrible novel, actually, and it's still in my basement. Um, you know, a lot of times I get asked, you know, why don't you publish that and, and put that out? And the answer is because it's bad and I, I, I won't. <laughs> um, but it was my learning novel, you know, and, you know, there's no real way to learn how to write a novel other than to start writing one and mm. learn as you go. Right. So, yeah. That's how I started. And it took me, I wrote that first one in 1989. And I, it, I wasn't until 2007, I think that my, my very first published novel actually came out, which was totally different. Mm. It was the story of a fallen angel. It's called Demon, a memoir, but it's a novel, but it came out, you know, many years later. So that's a bit about my journey. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> I mean, firstly, I, I kind of want to dig into this, uh, this this summer you spent writing your first novel, because that sounds like mm. an amazing foundation to get started. I mean, obviously, not many people mm. will get the chance for their for their dads to fund them, essentially, for their entire right. first book. Um, yeah. How how did you actually approach writing that first book? Because obviously, it's quite a, a mammoth task to suddenly go from having not written yeah. anything of that length to diving into it. And particularly, I'm guessing, um, back in 1989, that was a, the, the <laughs> landscape was very, very different to obviously how it is now in terms of all the learning. Oh. So how did you actually approach writing your first novel then? Yeah, uh, with a lot of um, naivete and uh, <laughs> blindness, really. Um, it, I also didn't, I, I was going over to the UK to study for the first month of the summer. So I didn't realize that having only two months to write this book was kind of an impossible task. You know, <laughs> the research and the writing, but nobody told me anything different and I didn't know any better. And so I did it, you know, not knowing that I, I was not supposed to be able to do it. Mm. And, um, which is probably why the book was bad, <laughs> 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 um, but I picked up a bunch of books and things while I was there and I brought them over, but I remember sitting down to do the research and, um, you know, there's no internet at this time. Or anything like that so it's all just books and I had read a book about maybe how to approach novel writing and scenes and stuff like that I had certainly read a lot of you know novels in my my life at that point um, but I remember sitting down with the research thinking this is a lot of stuff to be organized <laughs> um, this is a lot of you know information to to try to keep in my head at once how do people do this and also, as I sat down, you know, I had kind of a rough outline and a bit of 
a list of events of things that I thought might happen in the story, but I kind of winged it. And so um, I didn't have a real good roadmap. And so I learned, you know, just kind of the hard way and muddled my way through. Mm -hmm. And I, I recently found the rejection letter that I got when I tried to send it off to an agent uh, the following summer. And in that letter, the, the poor reader of the slush pile <laughs> said in this letter, um, your story lacks tension and your characters are two dimensional. Um, and oh, it was, this is the worst part. She said, even after reading the 23 page synopsis, we're still not sure what this book is about. <laughs> so apparently I had sent in a 23 page synopsis. So when I say I muddled through not having any idea what I was doing, that's the absolute truth. But, mm -hmm. you know, I continued to read a lot of articles from places like Writer's Digest. Um, I continued to buy books uh, about how to form a plot and things like that. And um, I continued to write mm -hmm. and learn along the way. So what kept you going? Because obviously there's a big gap between that first um, that first mm -hmm. book and your first properly published yeah. book in 2007. What was it that kept you rolling through that time rather than, because I know there are a lot of people that would fall at that first hurdle and just give up. Yeah. Well, I started another book um, that I worked on for about nine years and I learned a lot from that one too. Namely, don't, don't rewrite the beginning over and over and over which I have done <laughs> a million times. And, and now when I go and I teach, I, I tell people just get to the end and it's, it's going to be ugly and it's not going to look good and mm. you won't like the beginning, but resist the temptation to go back and read you the beginning. Over it's over. so okay. strong. Every book. Oh, it's, yeah, it's so hard to, mm. to, to not do, but I always say it's like building a house. You can't go in and do the woodwork and the trim and do all these pretty things on the inside until you finish the house. So you've got to yes. finish the house first. Then you have a, you know, something to work with. So I learned a lot, but I, I worked on that one. And, and then this idea that became my first published novel uh, came to me and I, I wrote it very quickly in six weeks. And I thought, oh, this is, you know, divine. It's it's meant to be. And, you know, <laughs> the angels sang and all this stuff. No, they didn't. Um, that book took, you know, six, six or so years to get published. So, you know, during the time I was writing and rewriting a lot. Mm. One thing that uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to like nail down here, because I know it's something that I've always struggled to put into words. And it's something that a lot of writers I've spoken to have all also struggled to put into words is, or, or try and find a source for at least is, do you know where it comes from this sort of tenacious attitude that you have within you to, to push, mm. to push, to push and keep going? Cause obviously writing can be very, very unrewarding for a long time before you actually find any of that very. success. <laughs> so, cause yeah. I, I can't even put into words for myself. Um, we were talking just before we were recording, it was sort of about um, three, three or four years before I managed to push and make that leap to full time. Um, and obviously mm. for other people, quite a lot longer so how how do you just keep going in those moments in which you're writing but nothing's sort of coming back I think a couple things have to play into that um one I think part of it has to do with your personality it just has to you have to have a tenacious streak in you um and, and you have to be really passionate about storytelling you have to love the medium um but the other thing is I think you really have to love the story that you're telling or the stories that you're telling enough to, I mean, let, let's face it, even if you have a contract, even if you know it's going to be published, every story you write is, you know, a, a year or more of your life by the time you write it and do all the edits. Um, you know, you may write it in a matter of weeks or months if you're, if you're very fast, but, but you're investing a large chunk of your life in that story and then through the publication process and then marketing it and then talking about it and then it's there and so as your other books come out you still have readers that are new to that other first story and they still want to talk about that so um you really have to love the stories that you're telling hmm. and your as mentioned your first book was officially picked up in 2007 how what are the major changes that took place between your writing process between when you first started and the publication of that first book? 
Well, um, I knew a little bit about how the publishing process worked because I had written a couple computer books. I, I wrote on the staff of a computer magazine in between there mm. when I finished college. And so that was um, not the kind of writing I wanted to do, but I learned a lot. And um, I, the, the biggest change probably happened after that first book came out because when you sell your first book, you've had all this time that you've been waiting to sell it to perfect it. But when you start writing on deadlines, so you've got a contract or, or if you're self-published, you're, you're, you're now creating these deadlines to put your books out, you're, you know, each um, consecutive book. Um, it's different because suddenly you don't have all the time in the world. You have to get it done by a certain time, get through the process and move on. And it's a different kind of writing because you're writing under a um, pressure that you didn't have before. And I found that I was really over writing a lot and my word counts were really bloated. And I had to learn with each successive book how to not do that and be economical with my time and my words. Um, how did you discover that those word counts were being bloated? Was that a self-realization or was it more sort of critique from an editor? Well, you know, I mean, your, your standard novel length is somewhere in the range of, you know, 85 to maybe up to 120,000 words. Um, that's generally the range where, you know, if you're, if, if you're trying to sell a book, especially, you want to be somewhere in that range. Mm. But, you know, my second novel, the word count was 167,000 words. <laughs> so I knew. And, and then, you know, my next novel... Uh, came in at like, I, I want to say it was 219,000 or something. And there are certainly some books out there that are that long. Um, but the, these books did not need to be that long. And so I was basically writing it and getting the story out and then finding how to um, kind of reduce it down like a nice sauce, you know, that you reduce mm. down. So That's a lovely analogy. Back to <laughs> soup and sauce again. Soup and sauce. Yeah. <laughs> Getting, I'd love to try and get a little bit into the nitty gritty of that. Were there were there any particular um, habits that you were aware that you picked off? What, what was it that was particularly bloating the stories, and how did you reduce them? Because I I I'm aware that I've got a few author friends that um, complain to the wrong word, but they, they're constantly saying that they they write large, they write large, and they want to try and peel it back and make it smaller. Do you have any particular advice mm-hmm. for people like that? Yeah, I think um, I think planning can help. Um, I, and I've always been kind of a hybrid writer. I'm a little bit of a pantser, which is right by the seat of your pants. Mm. Um, a little bit of that, but I find that I'm much more prepared and my editing time is really reduced if I can, can devote the time to an outline first. That makes all the difference. And so if I can do that and if I have a good sense of how my story is going to fit into the you know, not just the outline, but the three act structure, which mm. is something I really try to adhere to. And there's, there's lots of articles and, and books about that. Um, screenwriters uh, use the three act structure. Um, but if I'm very conscious about how I'm going to work my way through this, these three acts where these different things happen and where my character begins as someone who thinks they know who they are, but they're really not and how that change is going to happen externally and internally um, that's helped me to, to not re- overwrite anymore. And I, I haven't been a, an overwriter now for, for several books. So Fantastic. Um, yeah. And we said in the introduction that you are sort of famous for getting really, really deep into the research and your research mm. process. Uh, can you sort mm. me through a little bit what that looks like? And, and I guess importantly as well, how you know you're done with the research? Well, that's really hard because <laughs> you can research forever. And, and the danger is you can use the research as a procrastination to keep from writing. And you can you know, tell yourself, oh, I can't write yet because I'm not adequately prepared. Well, you know, anything that you're writing about, especially if you're writing about points in history, there are people who, who devote their entire lives to studying those points in history. And you could be one of those people, but if you want to write a book, you can't, you have to, um, you have to learn enough to be dangerous and to get a good sense of time and place 
to be able to form your story. And I let the research also um, inform my outline. So I don't solidify the outline until I've completed the research because the research informs so much of the outline. Mm. And then there comes a point where it's like, okay, I have enough outline to go. I will learn or look up the other details, the smaller details as I go. But one thing that also really helps is that I, I often recruit at least one expert, if not more. This is someone who's um, most of, often an academic um, that I can shoot some questions over to and, and just say, hey, you know, I, I got a quick question here. And for them, I mean, this is this is easy off the cuff stuff that might take me a lot of time to find. And and these having these these uh, experts in your back pocket is, is so valuable, uh, not just because it saves you time, but um I, I was always worried about being a pest to the to them, and I've I've found that actually, um, especially for these these teachers, they're so glad to have other people that are interested in in the the subject matter that they're experts on. Um, so many of them are so happy to share. So, how do you go about that's finding kind of my secret? <laughs> how do you go about finding the experts? Um, well, a couple ways. Um, I, I often recruit experts from uh, various places like documentaries that I watch. And so they have been interviewed in documentaries. Nice. Um, I also, there's a, a company called the teaching company that has the, the great courses. Um, and so this is a, an online company where you can go and you can buy courses by um, world renowned academics on various topics. And so a lot of times I, I, you know, recruited teachers from places like that. Um, also, as you're digging around, you'll come across articles written about, you know, things pertaining to your work. And those authors of those articles are great resources, too. So I just pay attention to, to the experts that are cited in these other, these other places. How do you track all your research? Because obviously I'm assuming that there'll be a lot of notes everywhere. Of- uh, <laughs> <laughs> categorize, organize, store. Uh, yeah, that is <laughs> that is something that, you know, from the very beginning with that very first novel, I was like, what do I do with all this? Um, so even, even several novels ago when I was writing about um, Judas Iscariot, for instance, and, in, you know, living uh, 2,000 years ago in the time of Jesus Christ, I was organizing all my research into folders with, you know, documents in each folder by place and topic and all this stuff. And and, and it's fine. It worked. But um, these days I use Scrivener because the, the way that it's set up, you can visually see where all your folders are. You can click on stuff. You can drag web pages right in there. And so it's it's really handy for research. I don't write in Scrivener. Um, I know a lot of authors that do. Yeah, I do. Um, okay, because it, it's so powerful. I mean, it, it's it's such a robust program. But yes. I feel like the learning curve is a bit steep for me, and I I feel a little stupid whenever I open <laughs> it. So I mostly just use it for the research. Mm. I know I definitely use the bare basics of what Scrivener can do and what I'll generally do just because I like that binder system on the left just to categorize all my chapters and everything else. Mm-hmm. And then after I've got it in an order that I'm happy with, I'll export it into Word and then start looking at all the, the grammar and the proofing and everything else. But um, mm-hmm. I can imagine the, the more you drop in there, obviously it is beautiful and probably I'd say the minute you started talking about research, I wondered whether Scrivener would be your choice. But I can also imagine yeah. that if you have too much stuff going on in there, it can still get a bit unwieldy. It can. And, you know, by the time I'm I'm close to done with a a book, there's all this stuff in Scrivener, but then I've got all these haphazard bookmarks bookmarked on my, my um, web browser. And I've got random stuff scattered all over my computer desktop. I've got books, maps, everything just all over the floor of my office. I mean, by the time I get done, all my neat processes are just they've just gone to crap and they're, they're all <laughs> like, it, it's, it looks like a tornado blew through. And, but you know, towards the end, you, you, you have this mad scientist kind of way of knowing where everything is, right. Even though it's a disaster because you know that it's either there or wherever, because you're, you're towards the end, you're doing this so many hours as you barrel towards, towards the end of the book. So. Do you ever regret your choice of genre that you write in? 
Um, <laughs> no, but um, I will say I, I'm not writing as much historical stuff, right? Well, okay, I say that, and I'm getting ready to send out two proposals that are both historical. So oh, exciting. Um, <laughs> um, I, I did switch to thrillers recently because um, the research is so is is so much. Mm. Um, yeah, but I yeah I'm gonna be I'm gonna be doing some more historical here. So no, I guess not. I guess I don't regret it. <laughs> <laughs> not the, and obviously, yeah. um, again, as mentioned in the intro, you've you've got a hell of a lot of accolades to your name. You have got the New York Times mm-hmm. bestselling, Indie Bound, Amazon mm-hmm. bestselling um, author. There was a Goodreads Choice Awards semi finalist mm-hmm. in 2019. Um, yeah. I mean, congratulations for number one on all of those. Oh, thank you. How how have you found the accolades have impacted your your writing, your, your fandom, your career, have they, have they given you sort of noticeable boost in any particular direction? Oh, I don't know. I, I mean, I think that, um, they're always nice to have. Um, do they really translate into sales? I don't really know about that. Um, but I, I can tell you that one piece of advice I always give other authors, especially new authors is, as your first book is coming out, make sure that you're already writing your next one. Whereas you're trying to submit your first first one, if you're trying to be traditionally published, make sure that you're still writing. Because what happens is when that first book comes out, um, so for me, it was Demon a Memoir, and it started to win some awards and get noticed by some things like that. And what it did is it kind of um, made it, my confidence falter because I was all of a sudden I was like, oh no, what if the second book is not is not of that level or not good enough or people read the first one, but they're disappointed by the second one. And I'm a one hit wonder, (laughs) you know, so um, it can kind of mess with your head a little bit. So. How how did you manage that? How did you keep going forward? Were you already sort of, (laughs) as you say, into your next book? Yeah. uh, Well, you know, I've developed a kind of a, a number one rule of writing, I call it. And it is this, it is right as though no one will ever read this. Mm. And the reason I say that is because um, new authors, especially, you know, who have yet to put their first book out, often don't realize that they're writing from this really special and protected place. Um, They're not being publicly critiqued or criticized or reviewed or anything. And so, you know, you're not, you're not fearful yet of that. You can be bold and you can be, um, you can be really bold. So I think um, being able to write as though no one will ever read it helps you keep that, that boldness. Do you have any advice for keeping those blinkers on when you're already in the, the public spotlight? Yeah, you kind of have to just fake yourself out. Um, I just kind of pretend that I'm in my closet writing with the flashlight, writing secret stuff in there. And um, that's the best I can do is, um, you know, I just I just have to pretend because at some point, um, you know, the only thing that's going to help you with the longevity uh, of a career um, and to help keep all of your stories fresh um, is to consistently write that way like it's it's secret and fun and you know this is the kind of writing that you would do you know just to entertain yourself or to entertain your best friend or whoever that ideal reader is for you for me it's my sister um the thing that makes you giggle when you're all by yourself you know (laughs) no I definitely feel like my my best days writing are the days in which I remember that it's supposed to be fun right (laughs) <laughs> that's and yeah that's exactly it and I've had those days where you know the market was not going well or, you know publishing is always in upheaval mm. or you know something's not selling or whatever and I've had those days where my husband has said to me um you know go have fun and I'm like oh Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's why I'm doing Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is supposed to be fun, right? And because we after when you're, you know, in a situation where now it's your livelihood, it's it becomes a business. It it is a business. Mm. Um, but it's a business of creating roller coasters. So it's a business of of creating fun. And when you make those roller coasters for other people, I always say you have to ride them, you know, screaming and peeing your pants first. <laughs> so <laughs> I love it. Uh, how, how do you deal with criticism and negative feedback? 
Well, you know, that used to be really hard. Uh, I'm not going to lie. It's not my favorite thing still, but uh, I remember my, my first one star review and my, you know, like when you have that panic response and you go cold Mm -hmm. or if it's really bad, you go hot and then cold. I had that and my heart was pounding and I remember just like feeling a little sick. Um, These days I, you know, that's, a, that's that's going to happen. Not every book is for every reader. Um, and a lot of really mature readers are, are very, um, uh, they give constructive, you know, criticism. But some people are just mean. Yes. And, you know, some reviewers are vitriolic. And the only thing I can say about that is when they are mean, they are telling you more about themselves than they are about your writing. And so you just tell yourself that, you know, they're, they're telling you more about what's going on with them than they are uh, what's going on with your story. Mm. You mentioned earlier that your sister is your ideal reader. What is it about your sister that makes her fit that role for you? Yeah, she's, she's a doctor. <laughs> and so, <laughs> it, it, you know, it's, it's funny. I always did better in science and she always did better in, in English <laughs> and literature. <laughs> and so here we are. She's a doctor. Um, today and I'm a a novelist um she's always been an avid reader even through med school she still managed to find the time to read I don't know how that's impressive Uh, yeah (laughs) with so so little sleep I think it was just her main way of kind of unwinding and um so she's always been a dedicated reader she's always had as much love for story as I do and you know she was she was one of those people that I could always talk to about Buffy the Vampire Slayer because we were both big Buffy fans. Hmm. Uh, we both love Firefly, all this stuff. And so, you know, she's able to read a book and say, okay, this part's kind of boring. You know, I really want to get to the action here um, because she's such a good seasoned reader. Um, and I, I know we think a lot alike, but we also have enough differences that, you know, she's got that fresh perspective. Um, so her feedback is always really good. So, mm. yeah, nice. it's always nice to have some kind of symbol of who you're trying to aim it to. Um, I don't personally have anyone within my line of life, but I've got a couple of people online that I aim and go, okay, that's that's who who I am writing for, as well as me. I, I think I'm my ideal reader, which mm-hmm. is helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit because uh, in perusing your website, I noticed you've got some interesting types of merchandise available for for people mm-hmm. to buy. Um, I just wondered what the story is behind some of that, because I, I find that particularly when trying to merchandise yourself as an author and obviously products related to the things that you're writing, it's easy to go down the line of stereotypes and get the same things that everyone else does. But you've got quite right. a few unique looking um, <laughs> items on it. You've got your, your character cards with progeny. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a 10,000 word one day writer's mug, which I'm probably going to be buying very, very soon. Um, and you've got your book club boxes as well. So what's your thought process when it comes to merchandising and selling that kind of stuff to you, to your fans? Yeah. Well, first off, you know, none of those things are going to be, you know, big money makers. Um, there's, they're just fun things. They're, they're fun things that I like to make available, um, to my readers or to my readers, um, or, or reader friends or who also write, um, so I've, I've had t-shirts that have gone with different, um, stories of mine. I used to have the glagolitic symbol for life, which went with my progeny duology. Um, and so fans of that series could get these t-shirts. The book club boxes are just there in case book clubs want signed books. Um, but they want to be able to get eight or 10 or however many of them and get them signed at a discount. Um, because, you know, let's face it, book clubs are, are, are lifeblood basically. Mm -hmm. And anytime you can sell, um, a group of books, that's a great day. But then, um, the 10,000 word t-shirts, uh, that came out of, I used to be, um, you know, I'm 50 now, so it's a little harder, but I do write through the night quite a lot. And when I'm really trying to make some tracks, I will... I will write furiously without stopping, without editing, um, just to get the story out. And so I used to have um, 10,000 word days, 12,000 word days, 14,000 word days, which are just monster days. Mm. I mean, they have, those are big days. 
And so during National Novel Writing Month, which is November in particular, um, I like to encourage people to just go for some of those big word days because it's a great way to get that clay on the wheel. You know, it's a great way to get the book out and not pick at it so much. And mm -hmm. so you keep that forward momentum and you resist the urge to go back and pick at what you've already got. So um, that's where the 10,000 words in one day t-shirt concept uh, came from, um, which is also a mug now. Mm. So <laughs> I love the, it's a uh, badge the of, the of honor for some well. people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. It's, yeah. It's like the Mile High Club for writers. <laughs> right. I yeah. absolutely love it. <laughs> Do you, uh, yeah, do you find, I know you said that it's sort of uh, obviously not big numbers, but do you find that you you get a continual stream of, of merchandise sales? Is it something that is bringing in something of an income? Um, it's not a big income maker for me. I may, you know, make a little here and there, but mm. um, to, to do it, you have to continually market it and keep it out there in front of people mm. um, during, you know, on your social media feeds, things like that the 10,000 word um, shirts and mugs are things that um, I'll put out there in November during uh, national novel writing month in particular, but I do, you know, I, I have taken them with me to conferences where I'm, I'm speaking or teaching. Nice. So those are, you know, those are geared towards a different audience than my books are because my books are geared towards readers and these are for writers. And I think that's, um, something to always keep in mind too, you know, when you're writing your novels, you're, you're not writing for writers, you're writing for readers. Uh, when you're selling your writing gear, you know, that's, yeah, writers are readers too, but it's important to keep those two audiences separate in your mind, I think. So. Yeah. That's so where my problem yeah. has been over the past year or so, because I've got a nonfiction arm in which obviously I do this show and uh, I'm releasing a, a collaboration, a nonfiction book soon, but I write dark fiction, but a lot of my stuff I've been mixing them both together. It's only really been the last few weeks, to be honest, that I've started actually separating those because you're right. Your, your ideal readers aren't necessarily going to be writers themselves. Um, mm -hmm. So it's trying to get yes, those, those some clean. of them. There is an overlap, like you know, where there is a place where it does those audiences overlap, those two mm. circles overlap at some point, because there are readers who want to write. But in general, I try to kind of keep them keep them separate. Mm. Yeah. You you said you write at nighttime. What sort of hours are we talking about when it comes to <laughs> nighttime writing? Well, uh, I used to not really kick it into gear until sometime in the afternoon. Two would be good, three would be good, maybe five. Um, and I, I used to write up until two, three, four. I still do that. Um, I, I don't write every day. If I'm, if I'm working on a book, then I'm writing almost every day. Um, if I'm between, between books, I'm not. Um, but when I am, those hours can go quite late. Um, I tend to finish every single book that I write somewhere around 7.30 in the morning after writing through the night. It just always happens that way. And um, so I, I have shorter days at the beginning of a book. And as I get towards the middle and start getting closer and closer to finishing, those days just become longer and longer. Um, so they may be 12 hour days, they may be 16, 18, 20 hour days, depending. Um, at some point in there, I have to nap or sleep a little bit. But, mm. um, I, I keep thinking I can't keep up with that. Um, it's probably going to kill me, but I, <laughs> I haven't found, I, you know, people don't change very much. And I was like that in high school and college. So, you know, I, I haven't changed in all this time. So... Have you ever um, tried to switch or wanted to switch? Or are you happy yeah, I've with I've tried. The... Yeah, I've tried. And I, I got married a few years ago and became an instant mom of four because <sighs> I married a single father. So I'm more tired now than I used to be. <laughs> um, and I thought, well, then I won't be having these late nights anymore. But I still do. Um, I think even more than ever now because that's when everybody's sleeping. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's the only time of the day was quiet. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you don't have to pick anybody up and, you know, school time is good too, but that's also, you know, my chance to, I don't know, 
eat something in, in peace and quiet or pick up the kitchen or whatever. Yeah. So I mean I empathize a little bit. I've got a five year old, but I don't I don't have four children to, well, to yeah. look after. But you understand. So <laughs> Yeah. But I yeah. See, I tend to squeeze my my time into the morning, but I do sometimes wish that I could do the nighttime thing because my suffrage then comes from the fact that whenever I see friends, they're all wanting to work on the nighttime schedule, but I'm an early riser, Mm. so I suffer more in the evenings if I see people. Well, and I think that the the trick is to just know yourself and to understand how and when you work best. And as an early riser, that will probably always be the best time for you. Mm. I won't change. Yeah. definitely seems to work right now um i have one more main question for myself before we go into the patreon questions which is okay. uh, a bit of a biggie but take it in whichever direction that you want to okay um which is why do you write oh uh, yeah this is such an important question i think for anyone who wants to write to be able to answer and there i will admit there have been times when it's been kind of rough and and i've struggled to answer that question but i can tell you um I, I write for several reasons. Uh, one, uh, it's my job. That's part of how I support myself and our family. So I write uh, to make money. Um, but the umbrella over that is I write to entertain because people need to be entertained. And you can look at situations like what we're going through right now where mm-hmm. people are sheltering in place at home and they desperately need to be entertained. Um, and so I'm here to provide that. And before the pandemic hit, <laughs> in much more normal times, um, <laughs> I wrote to entertain people and help them escape from just the rigors of everyday life, such as uh, t- caring for aging parents or going through something t- uh, tough like a divorce or um, to escape even just boredom or to unwind at the end of the day. And so um, I take my job as an entertainer seriously. And, and it's um, it's what I love to do. And that's why I feel, too, that it's such a privilege to be a part of readers' lives because you become a part of their lives and they associate your stories with different events that, that they go through in their lives. So um, that's why I do it. Perfect. And it's a, it's nice particular minute to know that art is basically keeping the world going around at the minute. It is. <laughs> or uh, seen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, okay, then. So I have some questions that have been sent over from some of my patrons over at patreon.com forward slash great writers share. Um, and they're both actually from Mark McClure this week. He asks, uh, I liked Tosca's idea of hiding Easter eggs in her books. Are mm. you able to measure or track reader engagement with this approach? No, well, okay, uh, my most recent one, yes, so, and I'll tell you why. In my, the first book of my duology that came out um, last year, both books came out last year, so the first book is The Line Between, and the second one is A Single Light. Um, I hit a code in the first book, and so this happens all the time, I mean, you have to put, um, you know, a character's name or a birthday or a number sequence or a funny little inside joke or, you know, you just, the, look, you're up at two in the morning, in my case, writing and, and you know, rather than do something like a, a random number sequence for a gate code or something, I pick out something that has significance to me or that has a secondary meaning. So in this case, it was a gate code. Um, and so i eventually let my readers know, hey, I hit a code in here and you have to figure out what it means. And so I hired a programmer to go into my website and uh, put a field in that people, if they think they have found it, they can enter the code, but then they have to be able to explain what it means. And so the next field is looking for certain keywords. And so I I actually can track it um, and see how many people have gone in and done this and attempted it and gotten through and the, the cookie, the thing that you get is you get a bigger chunk of the second book to start reading than the sample you'll find on Amazon or any place like that. Nice. So you can start reading the sequel right away. Yeah. And so that's been really kind of a fun thing. But other than that, no, I, I don't really have a way to track it. Um, but, you know, this was not a super complicated thing. And it was like $150 to, you know, for a, com- a programmer's, you know, an hour or two of his time. Mm. So it's not a big deal and an extra bit of fun for whichever readers are that engrossing yeah. want to try and crack the code yeah. 
Mm. And every now and then I get an, an email from someone going, I need a hint. <laughs> <laughs> Do you give them a hint or are you, are you quite strict with that? I just giggle a little. Well, okay, I give hints here. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, Mark's second question. What, are your, what is your view on blogging versus an email newsletter for a writer with a following? Mm. Well, I, you know, blogging, I feel like, is not as much of a thing as it used to be. I could be wrong, but I've never been very strict on blogging. But, um, you know, and you can put a blog up and people may subscribe to it. But I feel that if you have to pick between the two, that you really need the, the email list for your newsletter. Um, the reason for that is, A, you own it. Um, so if Facebook falls off the side of the earth tomorrow, mm. um, you know, you still have your email list. Um, the email list is delivered directly to your target audience. And so hopefully everybody who signed up is a reader or somebody who's interested in your books or your genre. Um, and so whenever you've got a book about to come out and you send that, that's your first great, you know, chance of getting a bump in sales. So that's really invaluable. Um, I would take that over a blog any day. That said, though, I, I do try to put blogs up on occasion when I can. Mm. I guess it's also mm. um, ticking different parts of the the reader journey as well, isn't it? Because if someone's just checking out your website, they might be drawn into some of the current stuff, whereas obviously an email yeah. list is normally for people that are more avid fans of your work and have deliberately already taken that step to follow you. I think that's true. And I, I think that you, you don't want to have your most recent blog entry be from like 2016. No. Somebody comes to your <laughs> website, right? Because they're going to be like, Oh, this person isn't even you know keeping up here. Yeah. Um, and I think it can be a good you know way to kind of uh, lure people in for back, lack of a better word. But you know, if they like your blogging, if they like what you have to say or your personality, then they might be more likely to sign up for your newsletter. So hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you, Mark, for sending those over. We're going to go now into yes. the quick fire round, which uh -oh. is 10 questions. I'm going to throw at you as quickly as possible. Feel free to <laughs> say pass on any of them. It's all just fun. Um, okay. We did have a previous guest set a record, so it's up to you if you want to try and do a oh, speed no. You don't have to. Okay. <laughs> what I'll okay. do, let me uh, set a stopwatch just because this is okay. more for me <laughs> than anything else. Oh, ah, the pressure. The pressure. Uh, okay. The pressure. Bum, bum, bum. Right. <clears throat> Are you ready? Okay. All right. Yes, okay. ready. What's your favorite video game? Uh, Call of Duty. <laughs> if you could live as one of your characters for a day, who would it be? Witcher Roth from The Line Between. What time do your kids wake you up on Christmas morning? About seven in the morning. Jungles or deserts? Uh, jungles. If you could have any non-conventional animal as a pet, what would it be? Uh, a snake. What one place would you love to go that you've never visited? Um, Mongolia. What star sign are you? Uh, Sagittarius. What's your favorite dessert at a restaurant? <laughs> I would rather have the cheese course instead of something sweet. <laughs> nice. What's your favorite board game? Um, Monopoly. If you had to choose one single book of your own to survive an apocalypse, which has destroyed all of your other books, which one book would you choose? Well, I'd have to choose the line between because it's about an apocalypse. So. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Awesome. Yeah. 57 seconds. Okay. Yeah, I want to change my answer to you. I don't want a snake. I'd rather have a monkey. Oh, nice. So, what kind of monkey? Yeah. I don't know. Something that, that won't be violent. Maybe a little spider monkey. <laughs> oh, good choice. Nice. Um, and one bonus question from myself, which okay. is where can my listeners find out everything about yourself and all that you're working on? Oh, yeah. Um, Toscalee.com. So that's just T-O-S-C-A-L-E-E.com. Beautiful. And I'll pop that in the show notes. Well, thank you very much, Tosca, for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I truly appreciate it. <laughs> no worries. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And I will see you next week. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of the Great Writer Share podcast. Don't forget you can get early access to every episode of the Great Writer Share podcast and the chance to ask upcoming guests any of your questions just by becoming a patron of the show. All you need to do is visit www.patreon.com forward slash Great Writer Share and support the show for as little as $1 a month. One more time, that's www.patreon.com forward slash Great Writer Share. Until next time.